CMT still, but at least you know you can proceed with your surgery and not leave some treatable neurologic condition untreated. So knowing that cable burst foot deformities are due to muscle imbalance, reconstruction involves concurrent uh, procedures within the operative session. And there are several deformities, at least two. And you need to correct the deformities and also balance the muscles. Because if you only correct the deformities, if you only correct the cable bearer switch shape and don't do tendon transfers, you'll have recurrent deformity. If you only balance the muscles, you only do tendon transfers and you don't correct the deformity, you'll have a balanced deformity. So you need to correct the deformity and concurrently balance the muscles so you achieve the foot shape and flexibility you want and you've done the best you can to shift muscles around to maintain that, that good shape. So deformity correction, in this case, we lead with soft tissues to realign them. In the cable varus foot, What's primarily holding the hind foot in inversion and varus are the plantar medial soft tissues, the abductor hallucis, the plantar fascia. Once the subtail joint is everted to neutral, then you uncover the severity of the forefoot pronation. That needs to be treated by an osteotomy to correct the midfoot pronation. And in some cases, even though you've released the tight soft tissues in the hind foot, you need to perform an osteotomy to correct any residual deformity of the hind foot. But you lead with soft tissue plantar medial release of the subtalar joint. <clears throat> and you reserve arthrodesis for the adult foot and ankle surgeons. Even into mid to late adolescence, most cable varus foot deformities can be treated without arthrodesis, without fusion. Soft tissue releases and then midfoot and possibly hind foot osteotomies. And tend, but that's the deformity correction. I'm not talking about the muscle imbalance now, just the deformity correction. Soft tissue release, one or more osteotomies. And recognize that the tendon Achilles is rarely contracted in CMT. It looks as though there's limited dorsiflexion in children, adolescents with cable bearers from Charcot tooth disease. But the equinus is not in the ankle. The equinus is in the midfoot. The definition of cabus is not high arch. The definition of cabus is plantar flexion of the forefoot on the hind foot. And the core for that deformity is the medial cuneiform. So when you have the cavalier's foot and you attempt to dorsiflex, you say, wow, the bottom of the foot is only 90 degrees to the tibia. But the midfoot is plantar flexed. The standing lateral x-ray shows the calcaneal pitch is actually above normal. The hind foot is fully dorsiflexed, but what makes the foot look like it's not dorsiflexed at the ankle is because the forefoot is plantar flexed. <laughs> Excuse me. And so in our treatment of the plantar medial release soft tissues, the medial cuneiform dorsiflexion and osteotomy, then what you do is you bring the forefoot equinus up to neutral, and then you recognize that the ankle is perfectly fine. There's no tendon Achilles contracture. The only apparent plantar flexion was in the midfoot and not in the hind foot. Why not do triple arthrodesis? Because we know at least the stress transfer to the ankle joint. And then if you have a triple arthrodesis, the ankle joint has been stressed out after years of trying to do subtalar joint mo movement. And then you fuse that, then you have a pan tailor arthrodesis. What's better than a pantalar arthrodesis? An amputation. With an amputation, you can play sports, you can play cricket, you can play soccer, you can play whatever you want to play. You can go for hikes. With a pantalar arthrodesis, you can't do any of those things. So don't do triple arthrodesis. And without getting into the weeds here, I will, I will let you know that this is a surgery that I think is the most beautiful and elegant surgery of the foot. And that's what I call my superficial and deep plantar medial releases. I have pictures of it in articles, chapters, my book, in the second edition of my book that I am one day away from revising. What I should have it done today. Um, 
uh, and have it to the publisher on Friday. Uh, I have a video of, of how to do this release. And I think once people see the video, those who have come to observe in my practice have seen it and they say, wow, now the pictures make sense. So I think by putting the video uh, online for the ebook, that then you'll be able to go back at the pictures and, and appreciate that the abductor hallucis has, has three origins. And between those three origins pass the two posterior tibial nerve vascular bundles. And the lateral bundle then travels under the foot deep to the plantar fascia and the flexor digitorum brevis. Those structures, the three origins of the abductor, the plantar fascia and the, the short toe flexors need to be released while protecting the two neurovascular bundles to begin abducting the adducted midfoot, flattening the excessive cavus. And it's an, just an elegant dissection. And that would be what you need to do for a flexible hindfoot with a Coleman block test. If with the block test, the subtalar joint does not evert fully, it means that you need to do the superficial release, what we just talked about, and also lengthen the tib post and open the tail and orbicular joint. What does this seem like? This is a club foot operation, right? This is what you do in a club foot. You release the soft tissues, lengthen the tib post, open the tail and orbicular joint. This is just an infant club foot operation on an older child and adolescent. That's the, I just brought it up some years, but that's the analogy of doing these things. That is the first stage of getting the subtalar joint aligned. And hopefully the child is presented to you early enough in life <clears throat> that do, either you don't need all of that release because the hind foot is flexible and you only need the superficial release, or you do the deep release, including the joint, because, but that is sufficient to evert the hind foot completely. If not, in two slides, I'll tell you what you do. So you do the plantar medial release, superficial or deep. Wait two weeks and let the skin stretch by stress relaxation. Because the next thing to do is to correct the forefoot pronation. And this requires an osteotomy. Some of the pronation will have been corrected by the release of the soft tissues, the abductor, the plantar fascia. That will have enabled the plantar flex first metatarsal, the pronated forefoot to begin to correct, but rarely completely. So then you need to go in and perform an osteotomy. Where's the foot cora? In the medial cuneiform, not in the first metatarsal. And these, this sketch and this x-ray was from an old edition of Lovell and Winter's text. And you see what happened when, the, when they performed the osteotomy at the base of the first metatarsal? They created a reverse skew foot. And that led to stress transfer to the second metatarsal. Now they didn't acknowledge that in this edition, and this must have been about the fourth edition, because I've been writing the chapter since I think the fifth edition of, of Lovell and Winter's text, and we're up to the eighth edition now. But anyway, this is what they used to say to do, but it's wrong. It's because the foot core is the medial cuneiform, perform an opening wedge osteotomy, and you correct the deformity at the cora, and you don't get stress transferred to the second metatarsal. Here it is. The good news about dorsiflexing the first metatarsal through a plantar-based medial wedge is that by placing the wedge in from the bottom, the base at the bottom, the first ray comes up, but you also get some desirable, though perhaps not intended, abduction of the, of the forefoot. And the reason is that on the medial side of the medial cuneiform, is just air. On the lateral side are bones and joints. So if you perform an osteotomy through the medial cuneiform and you attempt to open it from the bottom, keeping the base directly plantar, the first ray will dorsiflex, but it will open a little bit more medially than laterally, and that will create slight abduction. Well, perfect. You can't avoid this transverse plane doing what it's going to do, but use it to your advantage. You dorsiflex the first ray and it slightly abducts. 
That's in contrast to dorsal flexing the first ray through a dorsal closing wedge osteotomy. If you take the wedge out of the meiocaneal form, you will still dorsal flex the first ray. But because there's only air medially and there are bones and joints and ligaments laterally, when the first ray comes up, it will close a little bit more dorsal medially than dorsal laterally. And that means you'll dorsal flex the first ray, but also create some unintentional site adduction. That's why we put the bone in from plantar. If you put the bone in from plantar, you'll lengthen the medial column. If you take the bone out from the top, you slightly shorten the medial column, but you create an undesired deformity. In order to, to correct the pronation deformity, we need to put the bone in from the bottom. We dorsiflex the ray. We abduct as a little side effect. It lengthens the foot, and that's why you need more skin. And you don't have that in the first operation. But at two weeks in a cast, after a plantar medial release, the skin, the fat, the neurovascular bundles elongate by stress relaxation. And then you have skin two weeks later to do this and not uh, get necrosis of the skin. The osteotomy is performed <clears throat> simply placed in the middle of the body. You want to start halfway along the medial column, so you have two large uh, fragments, and you want to aim for the second metatarsal middle cuneiform joint. That way you've created an osteotomy next to a joint. It gives more mobility to the fragments of the medial cuneiform, but they don't displace because you've cut between the interosseous ligaments. The graft is inherently stable. You don't even need to internally fix it. Once you, once you put the, the uh, cortical cancels graft in with a tamp, it's there, no fixation required. So now you've corrected the subtilar joint through a plantar meal soft tissue release. And two weeks later, you, you go back and you correct the forefoot pronation. Then you need to look at the hind foot and say, okay, have I really gotten full eversion of the subtail joint? Have I corrected 100% of the forefoot pronation with the osteotomy? And if the answers are yes, <coughs> you transfer your tendons, you go home. But if not, depending on the severity and rigidity of the deformities, you might need to perform a one centimeter lateral translation of the calcaneus. What I was taught to do as a resident decades ago was to just do all the deformity correction through the calcaneus to translate it two, three centimeters. Well, sometimes the calcaneus is only three centimeters wide. <laughs> so, so if you're going to translate it three centimeters, that doesn't make any sense. But if you perform the procedures in the stages I have talked about, you might need an additional one centimeter of translation. And that's done through a very simple operation. In fact, the incision for the translation is the same as the incision for the transfer of the perineus longus to perineus brevis, which is the number one tendon transfer you'll need to do. <laughs> and, and if you want to get a little bit more correction of cabis, you can dorsally translate the posterior fragment. So that's what this looks like. Oh, sorry. It's an additive procedure, but not primary. Simple to do. <clears throat> and you can fix it either with a screw or wire. Up to that point, <clears throat> it's been all about deformity correction. And if we stopped there and didn't do anything with the soft tissues, it's likely the deformity would recur. Principles of tendon transfer. Choose the right tendon to transfer. Move that right tendon to the right location and anchor it at the right tension. Those are the principles. If you're going to perform a triple arthrodesis, tendon transfers don't matter because nothing's moving. But we're trying to preserve joint motion. And so right tendon to right location at right tension. Residents, fellows, the number one deformity in a cavalier's foot, I've said several times today and last week, is pronation of the forefoot. What muscle pronates the forefoot? The perineus longus. So the perineals are getting weak in, in sharp and tooth disease, 
but the peroneus brevis gets weak before the peroneus longus, apparently. The peroneus longus pronates the forefoot. So if we merely released the peroneus longus, we would, to some extent, balance the foot and stop the pronating force on the forefoot. <clears throat> but why waste the power? The, the two perineals combined are weaker than the tibialis posterior. Now we've lengthened the tibialis posterior to weaken it, but how can we get more strength of eversion? Well, we can release the perineus longus from the first metatarsal, stop it being a pronator, but instead of just letting it fly, we can weave it into the perineus brevis. So now the perineus longus and brevis have combined power on the base of the fifth metatarsal to evert the subterior joint against the tibialis posterior that we've weakened by lengthening it two weeks ago. The perineus longus to brevis transfer gets rid of a deforming force and it adds strength to where there's weakness. So it's, it's two in one, it's a wonderful transfer, easy to accomplish. And that incision that you see there is the same incision that you use if you're going to also do a posterior calcaneus translation osteotomy, it's the same incision. You're already there. <clears throat> there are other tendon transfers. This is a complex topic for the most complex foot deformity there is. Remember that recurrence of deformity and the need for future operative procedures is possible because we don't correct the underlying condition. But if we understand the underlying condition, the rate of progression of the underlying condition, manage what we can by balancing muscles in addition to deformity correction, <clears throat> we can preserve the good shape and muscle balance for years and years to come. I've operated on about 600 cavalivarous foot deformities, and I've rarely had to do a third operation. Now, maybe once they turn 21 and I can't treat them anymore at my hospital, maybe they, when they're 22, they go see an adult foot and ankle surgeon in Seattle. But I mean, we're talking 600 and maybe less than five, I've had to do an operation beyond the two-stage reconstruction. Avoid arthrodesis, keep your options open for the future. And uh, going out foot deformity, result of the problem, natural history is progression and stiffness, correct deformities and balanced muscles and avoid orthopedesis and tell the family they may need something in the future, but if you apply the principles correctly, it should be a long time before they need something else performed. Thank you. It's been an absolute uh, masterclass, uh, Dr. Mosca. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, the, the principles of aberration of the foot, radiographic aberration, the principles of KO virus foot, doing a plantar release, and doing it at stages. So that's what, uh, how do you convince the patient to come back in two weeks' time for another surgery? That's a very difficult in our part of the country. And, you know, I hear that question a lot, Thomas, especially for, um, for people, uh, for doctors who are outside of North America. Uh, th there's something about, I guess, in North America where we're, Maybe there's easier access to healthcare. We have too many doctors, and um, uh, there, there's something that I've never had a problem selling it. What I tell my patients, and I think it should apply both in North America and around the world, is if we try to, what we want for your child is this is the best outcome. And if we try to do all these procedures that are necessary to have the best outcome, there's a high chance that we'll get an infection in the middle of the foot. And it will take weeks of treatment to cure the infection. Uh, and then the scar tissue from the infection is going to affect the ultimate outcome. So it, obviously that kind of discussion takes a certain sophistication, whether it's in the United States, in Canada, Mexico, the rest of the world, it still takes some sophistication. But I, I stress how common it is to have this complication of infection, because, because we're, we're stretching the skin, it, it necrosis, it dies, it becomes infected, that to avoid that means coming back for a second stage. Now, if because of your environment, you just cannot get them back, you, you just can't, then you make some compromises. Then what you might do is perform your, your soft tissue release, 
perform a meiocaneiform opening with gastiotomy, but don't, don't try to correct the whole deformity. Sometimes my wedges are seven, eight, nine millimeters at the base. I mean, they're big wedges. So you can't do that in the first stage. And, and so what you don't correct in the forefoot pronation, do further posterior calcaneal slide. Instead of one centimeter, go two centimeters. So you create some deformities rather than correcting the primary deformities. So again, that you guys are asking great questions. <laughs> no, it's been fascinating. No, Daryl, do you have any input from the chat box? Or? Yeah, there is a question from Saeed uh, that how do you get dorsiflexion uh, in the chemo virus for deformity? So the, how do you get midfoot deformity correction? No, dorsiflexion. I think you so said the, the first flexion. metatarsal goes up, that, that concept. Yeah, the first metatarsal is what's plantar flexed, and the dorsiflexion happens through the midfoot. So you have to think about ankle equinus and cabus as two sites of plantar flexion in series. They're in series, right? They're one after the other. They're a series of two places, ankle joint, midfoot. Both can be neutral, and one or both can be either dorsiflexed or plantar flexed. In equinus, what we think about of equinus is when the talus is plantar flexed in the ankle joint. Cabus is when the forefoot is plantar flexed at the midfoot. They're in series in the sagittal plane. You look at the foot from the side, and equinus and cabus are both plantar flexion in the sagittal plane. If you correct cabus, so here's uh, so here's cabus, here's equinus. If we correct the equinus and we don't correct the cabus, we correct calcaneal cabus. The calcaneus is hyperdorsiflexed and there's still midfoot cabus. If we correct midfoot cabus, then we straighten out the foot and we can determine if there's any ankle equinus left. So there may be some true ankle equinus in a cable varus foot in a child with CMT or any other neuromuscular condition. But the first thing you need to do is correct the cabus. That is what you, you need to make the foot right. And once the foot is right and there's no more midfoot cabus and the talus first metatarsal line is straight, then you assess the ankle. And what you thought might have required an entire tendo Achilles lengthening might require nothing or maybe just a gastrocnemius recession. You want to avoid, so you always want to operate at the site of deformity. And in this case, cabus first, possibly an ankle, if it's still required after you corrected the midfoot. Saeed, does that help? Yeah. What about yeah. flat top talus, uh, Dr. Moscow? Because that's been our back. If you get the x ray correct of the hind foot and we know it's aligned and we have a flat top talus, what do we do? Okay, well, that, that's great. And I really embellished my section on the flat top talus in, um, in my, the second edition of my book. The flat top talus is a result of inappropriate casting of a club yeah. foot. It's not due to surgery. Yeah. Ponsetti and others, and I love Dr. Ponsetti. I, I, I'm very fond of him. Um, uh, but he, he tried to, I think, imply that it was surgery that created the flat top talus. What creates a flat top talus is forcibly yeah. dorsiflexing yeah. the foot. And because the, card, because the cora is the heel cord, then when you try to push the foot up, it's a nutcracker. Mm -hmm. And the hinge is the heel cord. So what happens is that the back of the tibial epiphysis and the back of the dome of the talus get crushed and keep pushing and pushing and pushing against this relentless tether of the tendon Achilles, it gets crushed in the back. So that's the etiology, it's not surgery. The reason that we don't see it so much with Ponsetti casting is because we correct the subtalar joint, we dorsiflex, and six weeks later, we do the tenotomy. There isn't time to crush the cartilage analog. In the day when I was training, we used to cast club feet for six months. 
Of course we crushed the cartilage on that. Of course we did. It wasn't the fact that after six months of, of inappropriate casting, we operated. It was because we crushed it. So when the, when the dome is crushed, it's crushed. And in a growing child, <clears throat> and so the neck of the tail is already impinging on the anterior tibia. What you need to do is to reorient the ankle joint. And that can be done by guided growth of the distal tibia with a plate and screw construct anterior, just like we would correct varus valgus with the plate and screws, you could put a plate and screws on the anterior distal tibia and create a recurvatum of the distal tibia, and then it moves the whole foot upward. If you lengthen the heel cord, all you're going to do is increase anterior impingement. The neck of the talus is already impinging anteriorly. So lengthening the heel cord makes no sense. Um, but reorienting the ankle joint in, from procurvatum to recurvatum is one way to do that. Growing child, guided growth. Older child, adolescent, distal tibia, anterior closing wedge, dorsiflexion and osteotomy. Okay. There's a question about implants. For, the, for your calcaneal osteotomy, do you advocate a wire going through to transfix? Or, and same for what uh, Ponsetti said, uh, Dr. Marconde said that he uses an he uses a tunnel to anchor. Do you you advocate a tunnel or do you are you okay with anchors? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the question, Thomas. So one is about uh, putting a wire for the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy. Do you put a wire oh. or just cast it? Oh, so for the calcaneal lengthening, I, I intentionally didn't talk about flat foot today. Number one because of time, but number two because next year I'm going to be doing that. Okay, um, but the the. In a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy for flat foot, oh. the reason for internal fixation on the lateral column has nothing to do with the osteotomy. Yeah. It has everything to do with preventing subluxation at the calcaneal cuboid joint. Evans got that wrong. Evans would cut the calcaneus and then he, he said, I apprise the osteotomy and put the tibial graft in. Well, the anterior calcaneal fragment subluxates dorsally. <clears throat> and if it subluxates dorsally, number one, you don't get full deformity correction. Number two, you get subluxation that may lead to degenerative arthritis. So two reasons to prevent calcaneal cuboid joint subluxation. If the joint is pinned retrograde with a wire before distraction of the osteotomy, there'll be no subluxation that could turn into pain later on. By preventing subluxation, the acetabulum pedis will fully correct the deformity. And that's the reason. Now, the wire that's inserted retrograde across the calcaneal cuboid joint that prevents subluxation is in line with the osteotomy, with the graft. So why not advance it retrograde through the graft into the posterior calcaneus? But that's the only reason for it. When the graft is put in the osteotomy and it's impacted, just like it was impacted into the medial it's inherently stable. You don't need a plate and screws that are going to cause skin necrosis. You don't need the extra expense of hardware. The wire is to protect the joint from subluxation, the CC joint. And because it's there, sure, send it in. But that's not the reason for it. Okay. And for transfixing this tendon transfers, do you, do you advocate a tunnel-like Jose Marconde does, or is a suture anchor okay with you? When you do, yeah, a, sorry, when you do uh, let's say, a, a tibialis anterior tendon transfer, is it okay to anchor it with a suture anchor, or do you advocate a tunnel oh. like the Iowa people? The, okay, Jose again, Marconde? It's, it's a little bit age dependent. Okay. I think most people are doing tibian transfers as the full transfer, in, as in a club foot. Yeah. And so here we're talking about a four or five-year-old with a very yeah. tiny ossification of the lateral cuneiform. Yeah. Yeah. There's not room for a bioabsorbable yeah. screw or other device. There's just, there's, there's not enough anchorage there. So there, the drill hole, the sutures through, tied on the bottom of the foot is the best. When we're oh. talking about older children, adolescents, <clears throat> then we're usually talking about, for example, a split anterior tibial tendon transfer in sharp tooth disease and cerebral palsy. Oh, We're doing a split tibial transfer. Exactly. Well, the best location for dorsiflexion eversion 
is the perineus tertius, right? So for those of us who have well-balanced feet, we have the tibant, which dorsiflexes on the medial column. We have a perineus tertius, which dorsiflexes on the lateral column. People like in CP and, and some CMT have weakness of the perineus tertius, but the tendon's in the right place. So when I do my split tibant transfer, I move it over and I weave it, a pulver tap weave into the perineus tertius. I don't care about the muscle of the perineus tertius because it doesn't work anyway, but I love its anchor point because the right tendon at the right location, that's the right location. And so I weave it into the perineus tertius. About 15% of people do not have a perineus tertius. So if there's no perineus tertius, then I put it into a drill hole in the uh, cuboid, because now we're in the cuboid for a split. So put in the cuboid, and I use a bioabsorbable suture anchor in the older child. Bioabsorbable suture anchor. Oh. Uh, then there is a question now uh, that instead of uh, doing a tibialis posterior lengthening, why not to transfer it dorsally and laterally? The perineus tertius, I mean, the, the tibialis <laughs> posterior is out of phase for dorsiflexion, right? So the tibant works during swing, the tibialis posterior works during stance. <coughs> it isn't known how reliable a tendon muscle can, can change its phase of activity. So again, tibialis anterior works during swing. Your foot goes through, tibant and tertius pull the foot up and then you take your next step. The posterior tib works when the foot's on the ground. So if you take the tib post and you put it to the dorsum, it may act as only a tenodesis, but not as an active dorsiflexor. Early, if, if the perineal muscles, tibant, perineals, are completely gone, they're completely wiped out, and the only strength in the foot is the tib post, then transfer it. But if the tibant and the perineals are a little bit weak, then I would say reinforce them, and that would be by moving more power laterally, the longest to the brevis, the split tibant, and weaken the tib post, to create muscle balance. And one other thing, if, if you lengthen the tip post and years later, when the, the CMT has progressed and now you really have no dorsolateral power, even though you've lengthened the tip post years previously, it can still be transferred. It has remodeled and you could transfer it to the dorsum through the interosseous membrane as you would have done primarily, but at least you've kept in-phase muscles doing in-phase things as long as possible. I think the other big message is that you said not to do arthrodesis because in India, we all walk uh, barefoot on irregular surfaces. I think so it's very, very important. The message that you gave it's to all our young, yeah, it's, it's a very important message about not doing arthrodesis and do more of soft tissue release and osteotomy. And that's a very important message. Didn't you want to close? So, shall we? Yeah, really, I learned a lot of things. The first thing which I really enjoyed is about like when the foot is curved and when you take a literal x ray, actually, it's not a literal for forefoot or a hind foot. So, you have to take two views one for the forefoot and the one for the hind foot. That's really a very uh, useful information because time and again, I used to tell the uh, radiologist that this is not a perfect view, this is not a perfect view. But now I understood the reason that why it is like that. So mm -hmm. that's really great. And the second is like two lines, one for the talus and one for the metatarsal. That gives us so much idea about the foot deformity. That was also very um, new and I really will apply in the practice also. And I'm sure all the fellows will use that in a practice and they will be able to understand where the problem is. So with that, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mosca, for sharing your knowledge. And uh, naturally, we are looking forward for your next lecture, no doubt after a few months, about your own procedure, Mosca's procedure. So we are really uh, very keen and eager to listen to that uh, lecture also. Thank you once again, everyone. And uh, my apology for the initial glitches. And uh, 
I will update you about the next uh, session, which we have in the end of the August. Thank you once again. Have a great time again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much for inviting me, my, my dear friends, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Saeed. Bye.